of the Urban League of London. We're thrilled to be here this evening for what, for the first um, lecture on what we're calling our public lectures on civic policy and good governance. Um, and and we, we hope to do more of them. So the intent for the League is to try and get out in front of the big issues of the day, um, identify the best experts that we can find, um, and then arrange for exactly these kinds of public forums to provide what um, I like to call transpartisanal information exchanges. <laughs> so the league tonight has no agenda. We're not here to argue for or against um, any of the system codes or mechanisms that Mr. Levine will be discussing. The topic of municipal integrity forms a part of a broader theme of municipal governance. And at the very least, I think we can all begin from the assumption that good governance is a good thing. <coughs> Excuse me. The informed citizen is an active citizen. Active citizens build successful cities. We know that we have 40 or 50 active and engaged citizens here this evening. You're here, right? Um, so it became apparent to us last, late last year that there seemed to be some confusion everywhere in the City of London on the matter of codes of conduct and conflicts of interest and how these rules could be monitored and enforced. We're, we're fortunate to have someone right here in the city who's a recognized expert on the subject. Mr. Levine is a lawyer practicing in London. With an, practicing in Ontario with an office here in London who specializes in municipal and administrative law. Um, he's, nationally re he's a nationally recognized authority on governmental ethics law, the author of three books and numerous articles, papers, and reports on the subject. He was also an expert witness on the policy panels of two major ethics inquiries, which I'm sure many of us will remember. Mulroney Schreiber inquiry, which was called the Oliphant Commission, and more recently, the Mississauga inquiry, which I think Mr. Levine will be talking about tonight, which is referred to as the Cunningham inquiry, the Cunningham Commission. Mr. Levine is also the integrity commissioner for three Ontario municipalities, and he may be talking about that this evening. And so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the podium over to Mr. Levine, um, we'll have lots of time after the presentation for um, questions and answers. And after the event is done, if people are interested, we're going to adjourn to the Fox and Fiddle in what is becoming kind of a London tradition after these kinds of events, um, where Mr. Levine and well, all of us can do some socializing and uh, enjoy a cool refreshment. So on that, Mr. Levine. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Uh, hopefully this session marks the beginning of a public discussion about uh, ethical conduct in government. We live in times when ethics in government seem in question almost daily. Favoritism in contracting, alleged corruption of municipal officials, allegations of inappropriate dealing of a CAO and a mayor. That's those three alone that involve the Canada School for Public Service, oddly enough, the Charbonneau Commission, and the City of Winnipeg. But the list goes on and on. Some problems we know are closer to home, others more distant. There's concern across Canada generally, there's concern in this city. My purpose here tonight is not to cast aspersions or to castigate individuals. I shan't dwell on what is so obvious to so many. There's a need for change in the ethics regimes and municipalities. What I have to say tonight may seem a bit technical, possibly a little arcane, but the means for stating ethical rules and enforcing them 
ultimately are not difficult, nor are they inaccessible. I do believe we can learn from an open discussion of what exists and what might be. My hope tonight is to contribute to the beginning of such a discussion, to raise questions and find, to find some of the answers to the ethics conundrum which vexes this city and many others. So I'm going to cover a fair range of territory. Uh, I want to look at codes and commissioners in a general way, conflict legislation in the courts, some of the models there have been for commissioners uh, that exist in Ontario today, uh, the work uh, of them to a limited extent, um, it, it, how one establishes a code and a commissioner and so on. Uh, and I will talk about the Cunningham report, the recommendations, not so much the uh, the uh, finding of conflict of interest of the mayor of the city, uh, but what Cunningham recommended we could do about conflict of interest. And some of the setbacks that we're now facing, the Ford case being one of them. So, ethics in government really is an issue, and we often hear this, we're all people of good integrity, we're all good people. That doesn't help us at all. I have no question that's true, but good people often do bad things. And we need, uh, we need something more than casting our eyes aside. As I pointed out, there are a lot, there in the previously, there's lots of unfortunate behavior out there in the public service at both the political and administrative <coughs> levels. <coughs> We have two major, we have had, sorry, two major municipal ethics inquiries uh, in Ontario in the last decade, the Toronto Computer Leasing Inquiry and the Inquiry into Conflict of Interest and Actions of the Mayor of Mississauga, to say nothing of many MFPs in other places. And two, there are the day-to-day so-called small things, such as name-calling and debates and use of inappropriate language which harms the civic polity by demeaning the process of governance and by harming individuals. London has had its share of press on these problems. London, I understand, is apparently thinking about the issues, having, which is great, having rejected even study of an integrity commissioner last September. Something incidentally, and this will be my sort of only comment about what's going on in that sense, which had already been studied, I know that, I appeared at a committee of council in June of 2009 to discuss the various models of ethics systems which the city might consider adopting. Publicly discussing what issues there are and what solutions there may be may help shape meaningful mechanisms. So what's the challenge? There really is and has been a persistence of inappropriate use of office and acting well in conflict of interest, or even worse behaviors. And this is problematic. I believe in public service. I believe in an ethos of public service. We need public service. The ideal of service, the basic ideal of it, of putting others before self, espoused by some of our greatest leaders, is surely among the noblest of human aspirations and actions. I'm not here to belittle the idea of public service. I believe in it, but rather to encourage and to suggest that it must be fostered and protected. Public service and public services are necessary to our well-being. Because such service is so essential, it must be safeguarded and its institutional and governmental forms must be models of proper and ethical governance. The institutions, forms, and practices of public service, whether at the political or administrative levels, cannot be used for self-serving ends. To do so not only affronts a noble ideal, but upends, demeans, and harms the actual efforts and effects of public service. Respect, fairness, and integrity are not just words. They are ways of being. 
They can be learned, they must be learned, if we're to have genuinely effective government at any level. So just a word about ethics, how I see ethics. I'm not a philosopher, not an ethicist. Um, when I say I'm a lawyer, people usually then laugh, but I won't, I won't um, say that. Um, ethics and morality may be seen as synonymous. I tend to take a simpler view and see morality as the principles and values which underlie ethics. And ethics are the actual notions of right and wrong and appropriate conduct which result from or are informed by those values and principles. Ethics may be seen as rules as well. And ethics law, which is what I've <coughs> practiced in one form or another for the last 24 years, are really the codification of right behavior and often state principles, but more practically established <coughs> rules of appropriate conduct. Um, sorry. Just some other terms before we go on. Two terms that are often used interchangeably but are profoundly different are conflict of interest and corruption. It, it's unfortunate they're confl uh, conflated because they are distinct and one may be the outcome of the other. Corruption is about abuse of office, typically involves serious and high crimes including breach of trust and bribery. Conflict of interest, though, is where public duty clashes with private interest. Municipal legislation in Ontario focuses on pecuniary or financial interest, but it need not do so. The key thing about conflict of interest is that it's not a problem per se. It's a problem of how you deal with it. It's what one does that matters. So at the municipal level, you should withdraw from debate, you shouldn't vote on the matter, you shouldn't try to influence people if you have a conflict of interest. Conflict's almost inevitable at some level, but it's how you act with respect it. And if you act inappropriately, then you may lunge into either profound unfairness or corruption. Just a note on that, though. Increasingly, codes are talking about avoidance of conflict of interest, and that's a tougher standard because that may mean divestment of assets, and it may mean blind trust, and we see that at provincial and federal levels, but it may not be really workable at the municipal level. So what is our regime here in Ontario? Really, there are four key parts, criminal code, the Municipal Elections Act, uh, the Conflict of Interest Act, and the Municipal <coughs> Act. And of course the City of Toronto Act, which uh, is distinct for the governance of that city. My focus tonight will be on the Conflict of Interest Act and the Municipal Act. I would just say that the criminal code is a federal statute, but it contains general corruption sections and a specific section on municipal corruption. It prohibits bribery and breach of trust and misuse of funds and so on. In the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, the basic rule is in Section 5 of the Act. So where a member of a, pecuniary, a council has a pecuniary, that's financial interest, they are to do those things, disclose the interest, not participate, and not vote, not attempt to influence voting. Those are the rules. There are a whole bunch of exemptions to the rules, and there are also saving provisions. Um, because it's seen as a serious thing, you don't want to throw somebody out of office without duly considering it. So there are a bunch of exemptions. The focus is on pecuniary or financial interests. I'm going to talk about that more in a minute, because there's a proposal to widen that. Um, but there are exceptions, so if you have an interest in common with uh, the populace as, at, at large, that won't be seen as a conflict of interest, and so on. The other part of this act is how you enforce it. And you enforce it by an elector, that's a person in the, who's able to vote in the municipality, can go to court. And if that person wins in the sense of 
proving there was a conflict of interest on behalf of the member of council or on the part of, the judge may disqualify the person from office. So it relies on one person taking a case and that uh, uh, person may have to pay costs if they lose the case. So it's an expensive system. And I'm going to just step back for a second. I wanted to talk about these two sections, that are two pieces of legislation because they form the core of the integrity system in Ontario. One, it's a bifurcated system. So one <laughs> is a court-based system with a specific set of rules about what you do about financial conflict of interest. And the other are codes of conduct. <coughs> Codes and commissioners are part of an accountability system established by the province <coughs> in amendments to the Municipal Act made in 2006. That amendment allows municipalities to create codes, appoint integrity commissioners, make a lobbyist registry, appoint a registrar, establish an ombudsman, appoint an ombudsman, appoint an auditor general. These positions and systems are mandatory in Toronto, but they're discretionary everywhere else. That's probably one of the first mistakes that the legislature made. Today, uh, we're looking at codes and commissioners. So councils can create codes. They have the power to do that in that section of the municipal. There is no specification of what should be in a code. This is different than in Quebec, for instance, where the statute on uh, ethics uh, has certain requirements that municipalities must meet. So what do codes contain? They usually contain a statement of principles. Uh, they typically contain a set of rules respecting use of civic property and so on. So the city of Waterloo's code, for instance, um, says, just for example, the code of conduct is based on key principles that members of council shall serve and be seen to serve their constituents in a conscientious and diligent manner. I won't read them, there are five statements. The last one's very interesting, are responsible for making honest statements and shall not make statements they know to be false, or with the intent to mislead members of the public. Just leave that. <laughs> Codes typically also have rules. They're usually fairly extensive in the municipalities which establish codes. Having said that, they are not a tax code. I often hear this, we're over-regulated and we are not in the ethics area. I shudder to think, I sometimes say this, what would have happened if a 21st century consultant had have gone up the mountain instead of Moses? Would there have been a debate about the number of commandments? <laughs> Probably. Um, but yeah, here again, I'll not go through a complete uh, code because they, they are so detailed, but the use of city property, uh, section six of the Waterloo's code, uh, you can't misuse city property, you can't misuse the information you've gained in the course of your duty. Two things are necessary to make for a meaningful and useful operation of a code. There must be education concerning the code. The code can't simply hang on a wall, as Justice Bellamy said in the uh, Toronto Computer Inquiry Report. <clears throat> Principles and rules must become part of the culture part of the way of doing business. So there's a lot of educating to do. There, there has to be educating and training if you establish a code. You can't just pass it and say, ah, oh, it's done. It's all over. We've finished. You can't do that or it's not going to work. There also has to be enforcement. There has to be some way to monitor adherence to the rules and to enforce breaches of the rules. The Municipal Act allows municipalities to have commissioners. Um, they're allowed, again, remember, they're not required. These commissioners, if established, do have significant powers of investigation. They're allowed to subpoena people, they can summons people. Uh, they do have deep, deep powers of investigation, and that's an important 
peace of having one. Uh, because they can, at least in theory, root out a lot of information. There are a number of different models of commissioner. Um, in um, Ontario today, one's what I call a single function model, and the, all of the municipalities I um, act for are a single function model. That is to say, uh, the, uh, the commissioner investigates allegations of code violations, reports, and then re makes recommendations to council as to what to do about a problem if he or she has found one. <clears throat> then there are multifunctional models. Um, and in this, the, the commissioners do all of those things, but they also advise and they also educate and they do training. And those are important roles, really. If you want to change the culture, those are very important roles. As it turned out in my work, I've done training in, different, in, in uh, two of the municipalities, and we're raised, we are raising questions now about perhaps uh, changing the code. But Kitchener and Waterloo and West Lincoln are good examples of single function municipalities. Toronto is a good example of a multifunctional model, and Vaughan is as well, and so is Mississauga. Um, in dealing with complaints, that was the other uh, piece of this, you really have to have some sort of uh, complaint mechanism to enforce. Most commissioners uh, are like what I call specialty ombudsmen. They investigate and report, and if appropriate, they make recommendations to council, and council then makes a decision as to the appropriate action. In two municipalities in Ontario, the commissioner just makes an order. It doesn't go to council. The commissioner makes an order. And those are Hamilton and Caledon. But most of the others follow the model that's laid out in, in the Municipal Act, which really is special, what I'm calling a specialty on this one. Um, so they investigate, they attempt to settle, and then they report if they can't do anything about it. Okay. There are a number of issues, and I'm going to raise more issues in a minute, but just with the specific uh, problem or task of establishing a commission, genuine independence is critical. If you create a commissioner, the commissioner has to be able to, without interference and with support of the municipality that creates the position, uh, investigate and make recommendations and be free to do so. Uh, we've talked about the functions already, but you'd have to decide that. What kind of model do we want? The other piece that you have to consider is uh, how complaints get started. Most of the municipalities uh, do this through the clerk. So a complaint goes into the clerk, the clerk sends it to the commissioner, uh, the commissioner uh, evaluates, do I have jurisdiction, and then goes off and investigates if he or she does. Some um, municipalities are now moving to uh, having the commissioner receive the complaints, him or herself. So it's not, uh, there's no filter at all. Now, I don't mean to imply that the clerks do filter it, because they don't. I mean, my experience is to just send it on, and it just becomes a record in the municipality. But. <coughs> there has been thinking too that people should be free to call the commissioner to, uh, you know, decide or think about, am I going to complain? Uh, there can be problems with that. You don't want a commissioner who's out there trolling for complaints. Mm -hmm. Gee, call me, I'll figure something out. Um, <laughs> you know, you want, you want people to say what they have to say, but there is also the help aspect. Okay. You have to think about what you want, uh, what kind of qualifications commissioners are going to have. Uh, the current group of us are fairly diverse. There are a lot of lawyers, but there's a theologian who definitely graces our meetings and uh, 
helps us think about things in a different way. There are former politicians and public servants. <coughs> Critical is knowledge of principles of fairness and administrative law generally. Um, and obviously it helps to know about what municipal government's about. People, I know there's been some interest in costs. Believe me, I'm not getting rich on this. <laughs> um, the $500,000 figure that was bandied about earlier, late last year, doesn't exist anywhere so far as I know, but I'd be happy to be proved wrong. <laughs> really happy. Uh, um, it, uh, Part-time, there are different models again, sort of part-time and then on-call are really the two basic models we have. So a part-timer will work up to three days a week. Toronto has that model, Vaughan has that model. Um, so they're in their office, they typically will have a secretary as well. So there's that staffing, you have to pay for those people. The on-call models are more uh, having a commissioner and if there's a complaint, come to the clerk, then it goes to the commissioner and so on. Or if you want training, you call the commissioner. Or if you need some advice, you call the commissioner. So that's the typical uh, model. Different, uh, um, actually I'll talk about indemnification in a moment. It's a critical part of uh, independence, but let's just talk about costs for a moment. Uh, so you can salary block the fees for education or advice giving and so on. There are various ways to do it. Um, or you can block fee the, the tasks totally. Oakville did that till uh, 2011. I understand they're changed or they're in the process of changing. Salaried are Toronto and Vaughan. Most of the others like Kitchener, Mississauga, Guelph and so on, they're retainer. The amounts, retainers vary a great deal. Uh, but they don't, <laughs> the highest I found so far is 24,000. Uh, I have found one lower than the 2,000, but the commissioner left, so I'm not sure, <laughs> not sure what to make of that. Um, and then hourly weights, rates vary from 150 to $300 an hour. Um, and if anyone wants to know my rates, it's $2,000 a year and it's $150 an hour. And that's been in the paper several times. Um, the costs vary, but you have to have some costs. Okay, so what are some issues with the system? I actually think costs are not an issue, but I'm, I am honest. But costs should not be used as an issue not to talk about this. They really shouldn't. A lot of good people out there for doing work for a lot less than they would be in other situations. So, some of the problems are, uh, well one is that we have this kind of confused system. It's a bifurcated system. There are courts and uh, commissioners, uh, and there are codes, and there's the statute. And why isn't this all in one place, and so on. So there, there's a kind of confusing access to it. It's far more complex than it ought to be. There is a need to harmonize the two systems. Um, the costs of uh, going to court as well, using a court, it's too expensive for the average person. I have been called, I won't tell you about where or when, but I have been called by people who say, I know a counselor is in a conflict of interest. Will you help me take the counselor to court? And you say, well, OK. But I'll have to charge you something. Um, would you do it for free? <laughs> OK. But what if you lose? Because I can assure you the other counselor, or the other counsel, the other lawyer is not going to do it. So are you prepared to pay 10, 20, 30, 40, 100,000? And most people aren't, and they shouldn't be. It's ridiculous. Um, we aren't all wealthy, and we can't all afford that. So a lot of stuff slides by because there's no way to challenge it. 
On the code side, not everyone has one, and they are not all exactly the same, so there's a lot of variation. So in, in Ontario, people can have the rights to complain in one place, but not in another. And they can have a code that's a bit more easily accessible than another. Um, and then most places don't have commissioners, but I do say yet. I think there is something inexorable about what's going on. So even places that are kicking and screaming, I think, will get them. Two events have led to, considerable, uh, to consideration of a range of issues. One is the Cunningham Commission, and the other is the Ford case. And I'm just going to talk briefly and give you folks some peace. Um, the Cunningham Commission made recommendations about the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act on the one hand, and then um, about Mississauga's Code on the other. Both are instructive to people who are interested in this. Um, and I, I re really recommend, if you have a chance, to, to read the report, or at least the executive summary. It's a very interesting uh, investigation. Uh, so with respect to the Conflict of Interest Act, I'll just look at a couple of these. Uh, recommendations. One is that the definition of conflict of interest should be widened. It shouldn't just include financial interest. It should include private interest generally. So not just focusing on finances. That's one. Another major piece is to try to harmonize the two systems. So you have the integrity commissioner involved in municipal conflict of interest act decisions. And that, had, that is potentially useful because it could reduce the costs of challenging in relation to uh, a councillor's conflict of interest. Because if you can go through a commissioner and you don't really have to pay the cost of doing that, that changes the playing field a lot. Um, so those, those are the two I mentioned on that. And then on the code, there were a lot of recommendations, and I don't want to belabor them. One thing Cunningham made really clear, which is really interesting, uh, he followed a recommendation of uh, Professor uh, David Mullen that said that really, you know, yeah, you've got the Conflict of Interest Act out there, but it's not the only conflict of interest. There's still a common law of conflict of interest. It still exists, and that means conflict rules beyond the Act matter. What the common law involved matters. That was very important because in the Mississauga case, the mayor argued that in meetings, she couldn't be seen to be in a conflict. Well, she may have been in a conflict, but she declared. But the whole issue in that particular inquiry was about her meetings outside of council, uh, you know, various places. Another thing that the uh, Cunningham tries to deal with is so-called improper influence and the appearance of improper influence. So those are just a couple of things, but these reports, I, this report will have an important effect, I think, ultimately on the system as a whole. I'd just like, again, to briefly mention Magner and Ford. <coughs> the divisional court, the second decision in the Ford case, <coughs> Ford was declared disqualified before Christmas and then revived after Christmas by the Divisional Court. And this hinged on whether or not council had the authority in its code of conduct to require reimbursement of funds paid to a councillor. Now, there was partly, partly an issue in that case because Ford gave the money to his football foundation. He never received the funds himself. And he, he did argue, why should I have to repay them? Because he didn't get them. And that's an issue. Um, but what we've got now is kind of a confusion. We're not sure. We know we can use Municipal Act sanctions, and there are two in the Municipal Act. One is to reprimand the councillor for being in breach of the code, and the other is to suspend the councillor's pay. Those are the two things that we know absolutely can be done. But what we don't know now is Nearly all of the codes across the province that have adopted them have a different level of sanction. So things like removal from a committee, 
forcing the councillor to apologize, reimbursement of funds, return of property misused, and so on. We actually are now in a kind of a limbo, because are those punitive, the way the court characterized what happened to Mr. Ford? Or are they remedial, or what are they? So there's got to be some rethinking about sanctions. And we're in a bit of a dark spot there. Uh, just briefly on other places, I've mentioned Quebec already. BC is an interesting model because it unifies the code and the conflict rules in the community charter. So in one statute, you have both. That makes a lot of sense from a knowledge point of view and accessibility. So all municipalities have that code embedded in a, in a statute. The problem there is that you have to use the court to enforce. So now you don't get a commissioner even to deal with the code problems. So that can be expensive. Quebec's approach is different. They uh, set their, the municipalities set their own codes, but they have to do so within a structure that's laid out in the, in the uh, Municipal Ethics and Good Conduct Act, which I think is a great title. Um, and there, the enforcement isn't a commissioner, but it's the Municipal Commission of Quebec, so it's a tribunal that enforces it. In theory, the costs would be lower, but they might not be, actually. So we'll have to see how that works out. So where is this taking us all? Um, well, if, if Cunningham's adopted, and hopefully it will be, we'll have a more coherent system. There's continuous growth of the system. It's slow but sure. Codes and commissioners are coming into being. Is it too slow, too uneven, too timid? Probably. Should we reconsider a centralized model that we had adopted by the legislature in the 1990s, which was then repealed? Never did get it come into force, but it seemed like a good idea. It won't likely happen. But if the integrity system is to succeed, municipalities must earnestly embrace the ideals of fair and open government and support institutions which will help them achieve a measure of fairness, equity, and transparency. And with that, I thank you. Thank you.